Hi, this is attorney Roy Oppenheim. We are here for week 18 of Zoom at noon. I appreciate those of you who've been joining us each and every week. I know a number of you have probably missed very, uh, have actually missed a, only a few or maybe none of these. And then we have a lot of new folks today that, that are joining us. Uh, for those of you who are new at this, we spend about a half hour trying to bring some information that maybe you're not necessarily seeing in the general press or from your sources of news concerning what's going on in terms of the economy and COVID and how that relates to each of us individual. individually. Today, specifically, we're going to be talking to Byron Jaffe, a good friend of mine who's a member of Rotary and is more importantly uh, an American Airlines pilot and captain for the past 30 years and also uh, equally important uh, is a commissioner of the city of Weston. So without further ado, let's, let's start. Uh, those of you who, who know who we are, our law firm has been representing folks in the community now for over 30 years. Uh, last time around during the economic crisis, during the foreclosure and real estate crisis, we uh, defended homeowners who uh, got in trouble over their head and, and where the banks uh, had to be sued to set them straight. And so this time around, uh, we're here to help everyone figure out how we're gonna get through this, this crisis together. As usual, uh, we're going to be talking about the uh, weekly economic update, then we're going to be talking about the pandemic update, then Byron will, will join us and discuss uh, the transportation economic update and what it means to travel, and of course the big question, to fly or not to fly, uh, is it safe to fly? Um, as we move on, most of you know who we are, Roy Oppenheim, that's me, Ellen Kolowski, my wife and law partner. Uh, we've been practicing in Weston for over 30 years, Jeff Sherman, who's been with us for, for well over a decade, and Paolo Vergara, who's a, a, an associate of our firm who helps put this together. And of course, Mia Singh, our senior associate, who uh, is part of, part of the team. And of course, Byron, who's gonna be joining us. As I mentioned, Byron's a longtime resident of Weston for 30 years, he's city commissioner, and he's a commercial airline pilot and a captain, and he flies for American Airlines, and he's based at the Miami International Airport. In terms of what our firm does, we represent folks in litigation, we represent folks in real estate, we represent folks who are buying or selling businesses, and folks who are just trying to figure out how to deal with, with COVID and get through their, their daily life. And right now, the kinds of cases we're involved with are typically uh, homeowners who are having trouble with their banks, or more importantly, businesses that are trying to figure out how to pay their leases, and, and also all different kinds of disputes that people are having among themselves that we would normally have pre-COVID. Of course, it's very complicated right now since the courts are only half open. And so one of the things we're trying to achieve is, is to have, help people figure out how to get through this crisis, even if they're having particular disputes. As we move on, uh, our last discussion was about how insurance coverage uh, can, can assist and us during COVID-19 and what we can expect and not expect from our insurance policies. And this week, we're going to discuss the changes in air travel during COVID-19 and the impact uh, that is having on our economy as well as on our entire community. Next page. Uh, let's do the weekly economic update because it's absolutely fascinating. Uh, the cont con containing the spread is the key uh, to economic recovery. As we're looking here, we're, we're seeing what, what's happening to the gross domestic product. We saw that in, in, at the end of the quarter, we had this major, major drop. Uh, if we can take the mouse uh, to the bottom of your 20, and then we, we start to see uh, a massive recovery, and now that recovery is starting to slow down as the spread continues. And so there's almost this correlative relationship between, or almost inverse relationship, that as, as COVID continues to spread, the economic recovery declines. And so it's an inverse relationship. And so if we can address the spread, we can also address the, the, the economic recovery. And they're, they're, they're directly correlated to, to one another. Next page. Uh, Initial unemployment applications, as we can see, they've started to, to drop, but, but we're still seeing uh, a lot of people applying compared to pre-COVID uh, in March, how few people were applying. You know, we have like four or five times as many people applying each and every month compared to, of course, in, in April and May, where, where the numbers were, were staggering. But as we go to the next page, we'll see that there are still lots and lots of folks receiving benefits. If we go to the cap here, we see that, that uh, as many as 25 million people were, were we're receiving unemployment benefits. It's now dropped to around 17 million. And of course, that's way, way below how many people, around 2 million people were receiving any benefits prior, prior to COVID. And applying for benefits is continuing to decline, but the amount of people receiving benefits has to drop precipitously for this economy to continue to recover. And that's gonna be a function of how quickly we recover and how quickly we all can, can work together to get through, through this crisis. Next slide. 
uh, pandemic update. Let's let's take a look here. Florida has surpassed Italy in, in COVID-19 cases. The state alone, I'm told, would be the equivalent of the fourth worst country in the world if, in fact, we we, we were a country on our own. New cases have, have been spiking. Uh, new reported deaths in Florida, while have increased, have, have increased at a slightly slower pace than, than the actual number of cases. In part, that's because the, the types of people who are getting it are around 15 years younger than, than, than previously. But the deaths are starting to increase. And if we can get Byron on, uh, on I, I want Byron to, to address this because Byron has some unique information on, on, on how our hospitals are, are doing. Um, can, we, can we get Byron on? Byron, let's see if you, we can pull you. Byron. Byron Jaffe. Good afternoon, Roy. Good afternoon, Roy. How are you doing? I am great. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hope you and Helen and everybody on the call here are staying safe and healthy. That's an important thing. I usually, I usually begin the conversations. I say, um, you know, when I do these Zoom meetings, I say, how many folks have flown in summer of 2019? And almost everybody on the call says they've flown once. Now, today, I ask how many people out of that on the call has flown this summer? And the response is less than 5%. So we're, we're in a very unusual time right now. Uh, what I wanted to talk about before we go into, into the, the whole flying thing, which we'll talk about in depth, is let's talk a little bit about how the hospitals are doing in Florida. Because at the end of the day, that's really the essence of what we're trying to do here. When we talk about flattening the curve, we're not really talking about flattening the number of cases. We're talking about spreading the number of cases over a longer period of time so that we can address those people who are sick and dying in, in a respectful way. And so the question is, how are we doing with our hospitals in, in, in Broward County and elsewhere? Okay, the, uh, the point on that is, as you just mentioned, is to when we say flattening the curve, it really means what's the availability of the ICU beds out of the total percent of ICU beds that are available. For example, um, and it was out this morning, I believe, but Cleveland Clinic, they have uh, a total of 48 ICU beds, uh, 24 that they use for medical tw uh, and 24 beds that they use for surgical procedures. Um, this morning, they have a total of nine beds available in ICU. What they don't report which is hard to determine actual how many people have COVID-19 in the hospital. They don't report out of that total number of occupation of the beds, how many of those patients have COVID-19. They don't release that data because it's a privacy issue, but they do release the number of people who have tested positive, of course, in the zip codes and in the four zip codes in Weston. Since March, we've had a total of about just over 500 um, positive people test positive for COVID-19. And additionally, I just heard the other day that um, uh, Mr. Moskowitz, who's the director of um, Florida uh, Emergency Management, he's made available an extra 1,000 nurses, emergency room nurses, in the event that we become overburdened in Broward and Dayton and Palm Beach. And I've heard that Cleveland Clinic has requested 20 additional um, emergency room nurses to be coming down here just in the event we reach that higher level of capacity. So, so a quick question. I mean, you're, as a city commissioner, you get briefed by the county and by the mayor in terms of how the spread's occurring. Where is most of the spread coming from? Where, where is, is most of, of the new uh, disease coming from when people you know, contract the, the virus? Well, uh, Mayor Sturmer and our city manager, Decker, um, they're in constant communications with the Florida Department of Health as well as the Broward County uh, Emergency Management Service and the mayor of Broward County. Those numbers are all coming from the Florida Department of Health. Obviously, Miami-Dade has had the highest number of new cases, followed by Broward and then followed by Palm Beach. In terms of the age difference, the average age is dropping on a number of positive cases. I have been told, though, that the methods of treatment are, are improving. They have the remdesivir drug that they are administrating, administering and also the use of ventilators for extremely ill patients. They reduced the use of ventilators because they felt it wasn't necessary or it wasn't providing the relief and to the, those patients who are critically ill. So that's a good thing. But the unfortunate thing is that we've had a, a very big spike here in Broward, Dayton, Miami, and uh, Palm Beach. So, so do you think the spread's coming from indoor air for the most part, because we're indoors so much during the summer, just like up, up north, people are indoors in the winter? They, they, don't, they, they, don't, they, they don't break that down, whether the person contracted um, the, you know, the coronavirus, whether it was indoor or outdoor, they don't have that capability, I guess. But it's hard to say. I mean, you know, we sort of opened up a very, you know, with the opening, with the restaurants opening, with all the people out in the streets, um, people being cooked up in their houses, everybody came out. I'm thinking that's might have what caused the additional spike here. And it could be just that the virus is, this is the normal transmission rate 
you know, as it goes through its life cycle. But in terms of whether it's indoor or outdoor, we don't know. Um, we, we can't be specific on that, but we're assuming that indoor has a higher rate of transmission than the outdoor. And, and that's a perfect segue. I, I want to go on to travel transportation and the economic update from the travel industry. Uh, Bill, Bill Lentesh, I'm probably pronouncing his name wrong, Chief Customer Experience Officer at Delta. He said that the 9-11 birthed the TSA. We anticipate there's going to be something to ensure customers safe travel, transit to air travel in, in the future. What do you think that that transit could could be, you know, going forward to make people want to want to fly again and feel comfortable? Uh, there, there will be change. Like just after 9-11, there were changes and all the passengers got used to it. And now after this, there are going to be changes. There's been changes already implemented. Obviously, we know that all the airlines are requiring everybody to wear a face mask on the airplane. Um, there are certain ex exemptions for people to wear face masks if you have a medical condition or if you're a young child obviously if you're drinking or you're eating you're not you can take your mask off um, in terms of temperature checks not in the u.s per se yet but international i've been to a couple destinations where they do check your temperature before you enter the country um, for the flight crews the crews are voluntarily being tested for temperature and before i go to work every day i do take my temperature now you, you were telling me the other day that you had been in Mexico City on a on a quick trip, you know, because you're flying international. Tell me what you do to protect yourself and your family, so you know you don't come home and, and, and get sick. What what are you doing on these trips? Uh, first thing I do is I minimize my time in a crowded area, going through security or walking through the airport. I wait till the very last minute till I have to go into security and walk to the boarding area and be in a large group of people walking back and forth because in the boarding area right now people are not required to wear their masks. It's only on the airplane. Then when I put my mask on, I keep my mask on when I'm on the airplane. Obviously, being in the cockpit, we have an option of taking the mask on or off. And then I stay in the cockpit. I clean everything down. The airplane is desanitized between every flight. People cleaners come on, spraying things, cleaning the lavatory, cleaning the seats, cleaning the trays. And we try to maintain the social distancing when you're boarding the aircraft. They have markers now in the jetway so that people don't get too close to each other. And then once I'm on the airplane uh, en route, I sometimes will have to take my mask off, obviously, to eat or communicate on the radio. And then when I get to my destination, I pretty much, if I'm not going anywhere, I pretty much stay right in the cockpit. And I keep my mask on the entire time just to protect myself from whether so that somebody else doesn't come too close to, to me as a passenger or a airline employee. So if you were a passenger, someone just asked this question, if, if, uh, if you're a passenger on, a, on, a, on an airplane, you'd be best sitting in the front in a window seat? I mean, what, what, where do you think the safest place to sit would be then in theory? You know, that's a, 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 a great question and that leads into a lot of different um, answers. Um, in terms of the airflow on the airplane, the airflow usually travels from the ceiling down to the floor, out the outflow valve, and then it gets recirculated around where in the airplane, people don't really necessarily understand the recirculation. In the airplane, 50% of the air in the cabin is recirculated air, and 50% of the air is outside fresh air. Um, and the recirculated air does go through the high energy, uh, high efficiency particle filters that the hospital uses, and that does filter out a lot of the microbes and uh, microorganisms that are in the recirculated air. Additionally, at American Airlines, I was just reading that we also employ a carbon uh, device on top of the filter to increase the efficiency of getting rid of those microbes. The airflow on the airplane goes usually, majority of the time, from the ceiling to the floor, and also from the front of the aircraft to the back of the aircraft. You know, it's kind of interesting because, you know, a lot of cruise lines, people, you know, good percentages of folks that, you know, were getting sick on the cruise lines. You don't see that on airplanes. I mean, you may see one person getting sick uh, on an airplane. You, you see that the people are a vector, that the aircraft is a vector, that, that individuals may bring the disease from one place to another. But you're not, you don't see entire planes getting sick like you saw, you know, half of a, of a cruise getting sick. So, so the question is, if you only get sick from the person sitting next to you or behind you, it would make sense if you were in the front and you got on last, that would be great, right? And you got out first. And then if you sat in the corner, you wouldn't have all the people walking by the aisle or towards the bathroom. So, so I guess you don't want to be near the bathroom. You don't want to be in the back. I mean, I'm trying to figure out, you know, you, you, you live on planes. What, what is the safest place? Right. 
I will tell you, first of all, just so people understand, even though the airplane, you're sitting in a tube and people consider that like an indoor uh, environment, actually the air circulation in the entire aircraft is the entire air is recirculated every three to five minutes. So you could almost be considered, it's like almost an outdoor environment with the air circulation. In terms of, I had one time I did ride and I've flown about 12 times since um, March. And I was deadheading in the back where I was sitting in row one and I was concerned as I'm sitting in the aisle and there was a passenger next to me in the first class section. And I had my mask on and everybody's getting on with their mask, but I was concerned the entire airplane is boarding, you know, while you're sitting there in the, in the front of the row. So it's, it's, it, it's, a, it's a risk factor that you have to decide. Um, it, is it proven that you can contract coronavirus on the air? Is it a transmittal of infectious diseases? Well, you know, there, uh, a professor for MIT just did a study, and he said the chance of uh, contracting coronavirus on the airplane is about one in 4,300. Um, so it's no greater than if you went to Publix or you went to an outdoor seating restaurant and you were sitting next to somebody. The question becomes, what's the risk if someone sits right down next to you on the airplane who is, you know, symptomatic or a asymptomatic? Right, so the real issue is what personal protection gear you're going to wear to protect yourself, not from the air of the airplane, but from the person who's sneezing and coughing next to you, behind you, or in front of you. I mean, I think that's ultimately the, the risk. But, but people say if you take the window seat, you don't get all the aisle traffic. And if you're not near the, the bathroom, you're not gonna get all the people you know, in the bathroom. We have some questions here. Let, let, let me go through some of them here. How does the airline deal with making sure people are COVID free? How do you know if the attendants have COVID if they uh, if they may if they make be to see if they're if they're symptom free? How does the airline deal with making sure people are COVID free? Well, you know, we, we live in a society where we're not asking people to take a COVID test um, prior to traveling on the air on the aircraft because of freedom of travel. I will tell you though that I was just talking to somebody the other day. We were. We've been flying to China since this began, mostly as cargo flights, and China is now requiring the uh, flight crews to be tested for COVID upon landing before they go as, as they land. And we have stopped that temporarily through August because of the fact that if you are tested positive when you enter a, uh, another country, you will be in quarantine in a foreign country for 14 days. In terms of the requirements, Obviously, we're saying, please stay home if you're not feeling good, if you have a temperature, if you have any symptoms of COVID. In, today, in the reality of today, most people who are traveling are very much aware of the symptoms of having possibly COVID or a cold, and they will not be traveling on the airplane. Yes, you, you could be sitting next to somebody who's asymptomatic, but there's no requirement to have a COVID test prior to getting on the airplane. In terms of the flight crews, we're voluntarily tested right now for that. And, and what do you think, and, and I can answer this question as much because someone's asking it, what do you think the liability is for, for the airlines if they are not sufficiently taking the precautions necessary to make sure that their flight crew and, and pilots and other folks are, are COVID free and they end up, you know, passing it along to their passengers? And, and I, well, I'll tell, you what the, I'll tell you what the policy is. It's not a FAA requirement. Right now, the policy is for every passenger to wear a mask on the aircraft. Um, with the exemptions that are allowed. It's not an FAA regulation right now. And I will let you address the liability issue of if an airline is responsible, if they allow somebody on the plane who has COVID-19. Right, interesting. Someone asked a question and, and you know, we're, we're so focusing on COVID, but where do you think the safest place to sit on a, on a plane is in case of an emergency or, or something you know, that goes wrong? On, on the plane. Oh, in regard, you're, you're talking about, they're just talking about the safest. Yeah, just uh, near, an emer yeah it, near an emergency exit, or if you're not near the emergency exit, when you get on the airplane, make sure you know where the emergency exit is because it can either be in front of you or it can be behind you. And you should read the briefing cards and, you know, so that you're aware of something if you ever had to evacuate the aircraft. And you don't think sitting near the wing is, would also be also say, you know, a good place possibly if there's an exit there? I, I, there's no data to support that one area of the plane is safer than the other, other than if, you're, if, if you had to get out of the aircraft in an emergency quickly, obviously the person who is sitting closest to 
an, an emergency exit or the front or the back door is the one who's going to get out first. Right. You know, there's a big issue about the middle seat. You know, people are saying, you know, is it, is it important that the middle seat be left empty, which planes are doing it? And, and what, is, what are the risks of sitting this next to someone if there's a middle seat? Right. Okay. The, um, that's a great question. Um, some airlines are not utilizing that procedure anymore. Other airlines are utilizing that procedure. Um, this report that was done by this um, professor at MIT, as I said earlier, he said that the risk of contracting COVID was about one in 4,300. And that was um, on an airplane that was about 85 to 90% full. The risk in his same paper, he says that the risk of contact, contracting COVID, if the middle seat is open, is left open, the risk is then one in 7,700. So there is a, a lower chance of contracting COVID if somebody is not sitting next to you. Obviously though, if even if the middle seat is open, okay, and you're in the window and the person in the aisle seat has COVID, then your chance goes up way more than one in 7,700. I was on a flight the other day I was at the aisle seat sitting in the back and there was a gentleman next to me on, on the other side of the aisle. He was not wearing a mask and he had a, a, a letter from a medical doctor that he was exempt due to his medical condition. So in that regard, my chance of, con you know, if he was asymptomatic, then it the, didn't matter. The middle seat next to me was open. So I don't really, I can't clearly answer that question. I will say though that if you're going to Publix or if you're sitting in a restaurant, it's the same type of risk that you can contract COVID. And in this environment, as I said, the air filters on the airplane do circulate the air um, every three to five minutes, which is a good thing. And of course, if you're sitting on the airplane with the middle seat open and somebody walks by you who's going to the lavatory, you know, and if they're sick. Right. Yeah, I got it. Uh, and you don't have to answer this question, but someone wants to know which airlines are keeping the middle seats open right now, if you know. And oh, I don't if, mind answering that question. Um, American Airlines is um, allowing people to sit in the middle seat. Um, Delta is not. United is also utilizing the middle seat. Um, I think um, Southwest is not utilizing the middle seat. But if you are on a flight that you feel uncomfortable no matter where you're sitting in the airplane in today's world, whether you want the middle seat open or you want, or you're uncomfortable sitting next to somebody, we will always try to accommodate that per accommodate you to move your seat so that you feel comfortable. And if there's no way to accommodate you, then on that particular flight, then we will put you on the first available flight so that you feel comfortable. Because we, obviously the goal is to make everybody feel comfortable to get to travel again, because that's going to save the airline industry. So assuming your family was to travel, you, you know, recreationally or for business or for a family Mac, what kind of gear would you want them to wear today as a passenger? I definitely want them to have either an N95 mask or a mask that has uh, some face covering that has a filter, not just like a scarf or a very thin uh, mask. I want them to have a, a, an actual mask that utilizes that protects them from droplets and, and microbes. I also, we, want them to bring um, Clorox wipes and sanitary wipes so that they can wipe everything down around them because we don't know, even though it's been cleaned by somebody else right before you get on the airplane, if someone touched it or went in that seat, we don't know. So I asked them to do that. And then I asked them to minimize their time walking up and down and going into the bathroom during the flight. You know, it's funny, there are some people who are doing this pre-COVID and we all thought they were like, you know, these paranoid folks, right? And they're like, right, the, right. they're like, oh, you see, you're all like me now, you know, <laughs> which is kind of, kind of an amusing, um, amusing thing. How about, I, face, how about face shields, you know, or glasses? Um, I haven't, I see people wearing the mask and the face shields. And I think that's a great idea if you're traveling on the airplane, if that's what makes you feel more comfortable to manage the risk then I think it's a good idea because I was, we were talking to the other day to somebody about if the middle seat is um, occupied, but if someone in the row behind you sneezes or uh, you know, is symptomatic, will the back of the seat prevent, you from, for, prevent those droplets from getting over the seat? And it is very possible, but I know a lot of people out there have seen those videos of how when you do sneeze or cough, if you are symptomatic, that those droplets will travel uh, multiple you know rows either in front or behind you 
I, I want to go back to the slides, but one good question is what happens if you have a passenger who refuses to put a, a mask on? What, 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 what's the protocol? Well, the, the passenger will not be allowed to board the aircraft. If the passenger has the mask on and puts the mask on and then gets on the airplane and then refuses to wear the mask en route after we've taken off, um, other than eating or drinking, they are advised that the airline will prevent them from flying again on another flight with that company. We have been instructed as flight crews, obviously, if we have a plane load of 150 people and one person you know, doesn't want to keep the, their mask on, we're not going to divert the airplane and inconvenience 150 people because we don't even really know what the condition of that person is. So they've been, you are advised that you will not be able to fly. And you, may not, you may be excluded from flying on the airline again if you don't wear your mask. Byron, we shared this, I shared this slide with you earlier, and it's kind of what you were talking about. It, it, the number of people who currently feel uncomfortable to fly, you know, is, was going down slightly. The more red means uncomfortable. And now, of course, it's, it's increasing again. You know, in May, it, it was a little lower than, I mean, excuse me, in June, it went down a little bit. And now, of course, more people are feeling un, uncomfortable again. I, I guess the real question is, how do we get people to feel comfortable to fly? You know, that, how do we do that? I think it's, it's, a, it's a perception that if you feel, if you have, take the proper uh, requirements with your mask, you get to the airport, you are not sitting next to somebody who seems um, symptomatic. You go once, if you take one trip and you are okay 14 days later, you're gonna say, oh, maybe I can fly on an airplane. I won't get, con you know, I won't contract COVID-19. Um, um, I've flown about a dozen times since the end of March. I'm going into a cycle now where I'm flying about eight days in the remainder of, G of um, July here. And I take the proper precautions and I feel totally comfortable and safe in what I'm doing. But it's an individual thing. In order for us to get back to normal, everybody first, I think people have to feel comfortable going out for dinner in a restaurant inside and then they say I was fine after that, and then maybe they'll say I will plan a trip uh, on an airplane, true? and you go on your trip. And, and not to contradict you, but I would think that the air in a restaurant is not as safe as the air in an airplane because you have this re less recycling of existing air in a restaurant and more mixing of fresh air on on an airplane. And in fact, if you look at this chart, it looks like very few people want to go on vacation in 2020 on an airplane. It, it's it, you know we're going back to the levels uh, back in, in almost 20, 20, you know, in, in the 1980s, yep. uh, if, we, if we go across, you know, and look at what the levels are of people who want to travel by airplane right now. So, you know, I, I'm not sure what has to happen. You, you talked a little bit about UV lighting maybe being, being part, of, part of the answer. Yeah, there, there's been discussion about that. Um, I don't think there's any scientific data. I haven't seen any that says that that is a, a suitable um, resource to use to kill the virus. Um, you know, the best thing I think is the um, taking your temperature, taking the precautions with the mask, trying to keep your social distance and wiping your hands and, and not touching your face with your hands when you're, oh, you know, when you're outside. And in terms of will people get back to travel? I think if the biggest thing right now is the international travel as well, that there's absolutely zero international travel. And, you know, as we, as you and I discussed earlier, did this virus transmit through an international flight? And until we have a, a vaccine or some therapeutic medication that guarantees that the mortality is, you know, is zero, I think the international travel is going to be a very big it's going to take a long time for international travel. To come I hate back. to say it, but each airplane is like a super mosquito or a super rat from prior pandemics where, where the vector is the plane itself and where in the black plague was the rats or you have mosquitoes from Ebola, you know, Ebola, you, you have these planes that are bringing toward, you know, people, three, four, 10, 15 people on these planes, whether they're from China or Europe or wherever else, where Italy were bringing the disease to other parts of the world. And so each time I see a plane now, I'm thinking I'm looking at a rat or I'm looking at a giant mosquito and it's, and it's really kind of bizarre. But I mean, these, we, we look at what's going on. American Airlines, you've canceled your 736 orders, uh, max orders, United Airlines has, has cut 30, 36,000 jobs. El Al is, is not flying, Latam is in, in, in bankruptcy. Uh, Emirates said that they're going to, uh, you know, they've cut 30% of their workforce. I mean, 
we need these planes to deliver goods because everyone forgets that in the belly of the plane is cargo, is U.S. mail. I mean, it's pharmaceuticals. I mean, these planes have to keep flying. I will say, though, I will, here's one little tip that I will say, and obviously I want people to come. I want, first, we have to get a, you know, we have to uh, conquer this virus and get some therapeutic and a vaccine to make everybody feel, you know, 100% comfortable like it was last year. But I will say that if you wanted to plan travel, it's totally fine to plan some travel in the future because the airlines have um, reduced their change fees or, and eliminated your change fees and the restrictions. So you can't, if you see a flight that's a good flight and a good fare that you want to book, I would probably go ahead and book it. And then, you know, especially if it's around Christmas time or November, December, January of next year, that it's okay to book flights in the future because the change fees are going to be waived and you have plenty of time to figure this out. And if you don't decide, if you decide not to go, you'll just get a refund or you'll they'll hold your, you know, you can hold the ticket in a bank and there won't be any penalty to change. And you can actually change your destination and your, your departure and your destination in there. I'm going to ask one question. So what's so, the purpose? So you really don't need travel insurance right now is the bottom line, right? Because if you right. can change your, your plans, you don't need travel insurance to ensure the loss of a, of a flight if you change your plans or cancel them because the airlines are willing to, to accommodate that. So this is probably not good for the travel insurance business, you know, industry. Um, right. I think we're going to uh, ask, I think there may be one more question and, and then I, I think that's, that, that's it. Oh, are you allowed to wear visors over masks through security? Uh, it, it, you know, and, and I think you've talked about the answer is that there shouldn't be a, a, a restriction on, on wearing a, 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 a face shield, right? When you, when you get Right. It. I've seen people wear face shields. I've seen people actually get in the full body hazardous uh, uh, white uh, jumpsuit and go through security, no problem. And I, and I, I respect those people because that's what's making them feel comfortable to go on the airplane. Right. Byron, we're almost out of time. I want to give you 30 seconds to, you know, if you have anything that you want to impart, some wisdom from both being a commissioner, being a resident of Weston, or, or being a pilot for 30 years, what you want to share with uh, the folks that are on with you today. I just, I just want to emphasize to everybody that um, please stay safe, stay healthy, maintain your social distancing. Please wear your mask when you're outside. It's critical. It not only protects you, it protects your neighbor. When you're on the airplane, it protects your passengers next to you, as well as yourself and the entire crew. And at the end of the day, I think we're going to get through this. I was talking to a doctor. He said he believes that we're going to have a, some vaccines that will produce suitable results by the end of this year. And hopefully that will get things back to normal. But until then, it's about managing risk, just like going out for a walk, going out to Publix, going to the office. It's how you feel comfortable and how you maintain your social distancing, washing your hands and staying healthy. And on that note, I just want to tell the folks who are watching in terms of our law firm, we're using Zoom. We're, we're following all these pro protocols. We have a hybrid. We're not that many people are in the office. We're trying to limit the number of people in a conference room. We're trying to do as much outdoors or in cars and do drive-by closings through our title company, Western Title. And we're being very respectful of, of the issues and concerns about being indoors and having too many people inside at, at one time. So again, Byron Jaffe, thank you so very much on behalf of the law firm Oppenheim Law and Weston Title, our title company, and all the lawyers and, and the administrative support that allows us to get this done, including Lance Oppenheim, my son who helps direct this every week. I wanna thank you all very, very much for being here until we are we, we're back together next week for Zoom at noon, 19, COVID-19, oh God. Anyway, uh, have a great week, <laughs> take care, bye-bye.